Hi, my name is John Markoff, and uh, this is uh, an event for the an interview for the Computer History Museum. I'm speaking with Douglas Engelbart, who invented the computer mouse and much of the other technology that went into today's that goes into today's personal computers. I wanted to begin um, by asking you about growing up in Oregon, and um, uh, my memory is that you grew up on a farm. Um, was it close to Portland? It was. It was very, very small. It was just in a small farm area and uh, where everybody had other jobs. Uh, what and, did your parents do? Well, my father uh, uh, had developed a radio shop. He was trained as an electrical engineer, so very early radio, he, he uh -huh. said, ah, I can capitalize on that. So you were growing up outside of an urban area, but yet your father was a technical person. You, yeah. That's the best of both worlds. Well. <laughs> Well, the problem is he died when I was nine, and up until then he's working he's very long hours in the Depression time to make things hold together. I see. So I didn't get any technology from him. Well, you didn't grow up amongst the test, the tubes or no, anything? No. no. Okay. How close to Portland was your, was your home? Was it Portland was the big city, or was it? Oh, yeah. It, we were about three or four miles outside the city limits. I see. And, oh, okay. But it was... Beautiful area, beautiful creek running right through our property and into 90 acres of untouched fir forest that was our backyard. Oh, and, uh, and so that creek and that forest were terrific and it was on a dead end curvy road so it was very quiet and private. And, and always raining? No, I remember two or three days of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, after your father Died. Your mom stayed on the. You, you stayed in the same place. You didn't move. And, right. yeah. um, did you have any interest in technology while you were growing up before you left home? Well, I I, I liked to, to do a lot of things, and I would invent things like, and then I got interested in in uh, making a rope, and. Uh, so I found out that the gunny sacks that our grain came in, to, or a cow feed came in, uh, was strand by strand, and I could pull the strands out and tie it and make a very, very long string. And then I would double that and twist it up and then double it again, it would make a rope. And then I would twist that up. And, and I ended up making a rope about 40 feet long that was strong enough to hurry, hold my weight, and I would use that for climbing trees. And, um, and you know, different funny boats and uh, then one day when I was about 13 or 14 I found a in an abandoned barn nearby I found an abandoned car that just intrigued me very much it had a brass radiator and kerosene parking lights and uh, it was a 1916 model T Ford oh my God. but that's even older than I am See? <laughs> <laughs> did you make it? Did it work, or did you make yeah. it work again? Yeah, I, I bought it for ten dollars uh, and uh, hauled it home, borrowed it from the home, and spent the next year or so taking it all apart and getting it finally working. So it was just. Do you remember roughly how old were you when you did that? Oh, fifteen. Like we could drive on our back roads without licenses. <laughs> but, but then you had a car to go to school with too. Well. That was even old in those days. It didn't have a, it was a year before they started at automatically putting on electric starters on cars. So you had to crank yes, start it? Right. And then the electric, the headlights worked off the magneto. So the faster the engine ran, the brighter the lights would get. See? And uh, it was a, it was just a beautiful little old car and that, anyway. You went to Corvallis, uh, universe, uh, the Oregon State University to to college? Yeah. And what did you study? Well, I, I studied, I took, entered as an engineering student aiming for electrical engineering, but the main reason was the war had started when I was about 16, I guess, World War II, not the Civil War. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, then there was a lot of talk about this secret thing called radar, and oh, the Navy had a program they would train people to maintain that. So it sounded so dramatic that uh, you came into the classroom and they locked all the doors. Then they took the 
textbooks out of the lock, the, and then you had your class, and then you put them all back in the vault and locked it up before they let you out of the classroom. And that just sounded so much. So that's why I started saying, well, I think I'll take electrical engineering, because that'd be a... Do you think there was any connection between your dad's profession and your interest 10 years later in study? Was there a uh, link at all? Or it if was... there were any, it would have been a negative one, because when I was 10 or 11, I remember noticing the textbooks he'd studied in and looking at them and saying, oh, God, you were like too much for me. So, But it was that, that the secrecy of radar and the fact that I probably was going to get drafted so I did get drafted, and then I had that training, so I got into that Navy training program. How many years did you go to school before you were drafted? Did you Just exactly two. Ah. I see. So then you were drafted, and you were sent off to operate radar systems in the Pacific. Well, I, I had a year's training first, all the basic training and all the kinds of equipment and the maintenance you had, and uh, then you get to be a certified electronic technician. Okay. And, uh, you told me a wonderful story about shipping out to the Pacific. Yeah. Tell me the story of, uh, of this, was, this must have been 45, 1945. It was a spring, and that's when I finished the training. And uh, <clears throat> so they loaded us up uh, on an old converted freight ship, converted to a troop ship, and uh, the San Francisco Harbor, but it was just south of the Bay Bridge in there, and uh, we were all kind of nervous because we were going to go invade Japan. And there were soldiers, Marines, sailors, mixture, and the boat backed out and trundled along underneath the Bay Bridge around towards the Gold Gate out to sea. And we just got part way past the Bay Bridge, and uh, the captain came out on the bridge and looked down on us. Japan just surrendered, he shouts. And oh my gosh, you could just see. Then suddenly all, uh, every, all kind of, what is it, propriety or something, leaves us. We all said, well, for Christ's sake, turn around. <laughs> and he goes like this. And, but anyway, it was a very different trip. So, and I remember you, hear, you hearing the sounds from San Francisco as the people began celebrating as yeah. they went out. Under. Whistles blowing. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, you had to go to the Pacific anyway. The war was over. Yeah, you can't imagine that they could not, couldn't just stop everybody where they were. It was so 38 days later, at about 10 miles an hour, we got to the Philippines. And, and your job was a radar, radar operator? No, oh. a, a technician that would be maintenance. So it wasn't just radar, radar, radio, sonar, teletype, any kind of communication, electronics. Okay. And, uh, and um, you were a reader by that time, a voracious reader. You you liked to just sort of burrow into was, was I mean. Well, that's what I discovered. Yeah, I had been a reader and curious way back. And then in early years of college, I found the library and the stacks and how they were tolerant enough to let me go probing in there. And I just did read a lot and. So you found a reading room while you were on one. It was a small island, right? Where, where? Oh, when we first landed in the Philippines, it's what they call a receiving ship, even though it's a camp in the jungle, right on the edge of the jungle on the island. And uh, they dump the shipload of people there, and then you get assigned to different places and, and traveled from there in small groups to different assignments. So. Uh, that's one was it was right on the edge of the, the jungle and uh, interesting, but I discovered that native Philippine hut on stilts, thatch roof and everything, that had a sign on it said Red Cross Library, and uh, they had to climb up the ladder into the f nice clean floor, about maybe 15 feet across, circular like this and books and magazines. <laughs> it's funny, so I started camping out there, you know, a lot of time there. I think I was there about four or five days or something like that. But uh, Oh, so uh, this, was new. this was right after you, it was early on? Just when we got okay. there. Okay. Yeah, interesting. And, uh, so that's, that's when I found that Life magazine article that was sort of a takeoff of what Atlantic Monthly had had some months earlier. 
uh, that was Vannevar Bush and his Memex description. And this was a machine that was, there weren't really computers at this point, but this was a machine that was an information retrieval machine? Yeah, he, in microfiche, <clears throat> just a small size a hunk of film that you can move and view and stuff, and each one of them has a set of frames on it, etc. So he said what each one should do is sort of have what would be the equivalent of a link today is, you know, it's a referring to some other one of those fish, and they'd like to have a mechanical thing that could go get it for you from the list. <clears throat> and it was never built, but that seemed intriguing. But that didn't surface for me Let's see, that was 1945. It was five years it was about, later, I it was think. about 15 years later. Oh, it was 15. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come, we'll come yeah. to that. You also mentioned, so um, the, idea of, the idea of hypertext, you stumbled across the idea of links and the ability to, to the, but you also, I also remember you found a magazine article, and I don't remember the details, but it was about sort of making something with your life. How to make the most of your life. Yes, what was that article? That was oh, that was a book. A book. That Tell me a little, I mean, but it had an impression on you. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, I'd never heard about, you know, trying to talk about how you can plan and et cetera. And, uh, you know, I just totally, there, there was no professional discussions that I heard at all among my neighbors or anybody about planning, careers, et cetera. And uh, especially during the Depression when jobs were scarce, most people were just happy to have a steady job. See? And uh, so I didn't have any great thinking about that. But I found this book in the library in the, where I was stationed in Manila for the year. And uh, so the library there, too, was almost never anybody else in it. So <laughs> I boomed a lot. So that was one of the books I found, and it was, it was just one of the cheery kind of things about advice of how to tune your life and think positive and try for things, etc. But it somehow impressed me so much that uh, it led me astray. I stole the book when I left, <laughs> but I didn't feel very guilty because almost no one was ever in the library. <laughs> and uh, you, you came back to the West Coast and you finished your college degree. In, in Oregon, right. But now, when you went to Berkeley, did no? Yeah. You, you, oh, that's right. You before you went to Berkeley, you came to California. Yeah, I uh, I just happened to take a job offer down here in the Silicon, I mean, the San Francisco area, <laughs> at uh, the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, and uh, you know, various people had come from different companies, etc., to give talks and and try to uh, enlist graduating, graduating students. And so I had been signed up to go to General Electric back east. And then this fellow came from the Ames Laboratory here to talk about what could be done there. And uh, then I remember how f much fun it was in the San Francisco area, because my last seven months of training were on the Navy, what the Navy owned Treasure Island at the time. and. Um, so I thought, gee, that's fun. It's right near Stanford, girls. And <laughs> so uh, for some reason, I signed up to come down here. Okay. And, now, when you went to work um, at Ames, um, you ended up supporting the wind tunnels. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I thought I was coming to work in the instrumentation development group, but I got sort of waylaid as I first came in. See. The Greyhound bus I was on stopped at the stoplight at Moffat Boulevard and 101. <laughs> I'm laughing now because it was not a freeway. <laughs> so I trundled up there. And uh, so it wasn't long before the smooth talking guy came and, and uh, intercepted and, and start, talked me into, oh, it's much more interesting, this other group, you know, we take care of the wind tunnels and all that. And, but it was an education. Uh, so I was there three years before I got my whatever it is. The, oh, I see. So before you decided that you needed to, to move before on. Before I got the, the big turn on it, uh, I don't know, what, what you call it, just... Uh, vision, I, in, insight? Uh, well, the sequence of them. First, first, soon after I got engaged, 
I suddenly realized I didn't have any goals professionally. Here are all these interesting goals about getting married and a family. And uh, uh, so the day I realized that was the Monday after I got engaged, driving to work. Oh, I better get goals to work. And for some reason, what flashed in my head that just changed my life forever was, oh, goal. And hey, that's interesting. I've never thought about having a, a real goal professionally. And that's how naive country boy. And so another naive country boyish thing that what came up and I said, oh, that sounds good. Let's grab that as a goal. And the goal, I, I just was welded in my mind because it says, hey, why don't I pick a goal that'll maximize the benefits my career will have to mankind? Just a 25-year-old country boy, I don't know what came from, but it was just so clear. And uh, you were still at Ames at this point. Yeah. Okay. That's so you were was, driving to work, and right. were you you weren't living in Atherton by that time. Where did you live at? Oh, room? I I was renting a room in, in Los Altos. Okay. And you were engaged, but you you got you guys weren't married yet. Oh, I've been engaged for two days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to go backwards for a second because there's there's something I wanted to to ask you about in terms of the way your thinking evolved. Um, you told me about um, uh, your experience in the wind tunnel or seeing how they develop stuff in the wind tunnel. And you, you basically came in contact with the idea of scaling. And there was a word you, you used that was used in terms, and I've forgotten the word, about they were interested in scaling down. Oh, they were interested in scaling up. Um, and there was a word that described that, an engineering term. Do you, do you remember? Well, the d dimensional analysis, they call it, in scaling. And then there are some, you can put together different factors, you know, how many feet per second you go and how many seconds for this or that. And if you juggle them so that this array of terms, all the dimensions cancel out, they call it dimensional, dimensionless number. And it just turns out in a funny way that uh, if any other thing you make has the same, you know, if that dimensionless number changes, that's what's going to give you in that scaling. But, but um, it just it just came into my mind of hey, you can test this little piece of a wind foil, airfoil in a wind tunnel, and translate that accurately to what it means in a big wind tunnel, which just changes. So uh, yeah. Okay, I'll come back to that. But I realized I interrupted you because you had a series of insights. One was <laughs> that you needed a goal, but there was another one. Yeah, the goal about. Hey, how, how does how does your maxim how can you maximize the benefit your career will have to mankind, which uh, you know how did this that just a, a, a real sign of how naive country boyish uh, things I've never quite gotten over, <laughs> but uh, uh, oh well what what are some of the really big challenges mankind has that if you can really help that you've really contributed. And this got me into starting looking at the library and things about big, tough, complex goals and such, you know, like, hey, the, the uh, malaria problems in some tropical areas where you've got whole places where everybody is so beat down by having malaria all the time. Oh, you could drain the swamps. Oh, yes, but how do you get the money to do that? How do you coordinate it? Well, then if you drain the swamps, I realized one day the you know, that uh, they stop being sick all the time, well, the population will probably grow faster and exceed the sustenance capability of the land. And, you know, it's just not simple. And that's what just dawned on me one Saturday. All these problems are very big. Oh, and they have to be dealt with collectively. And we're not getting smarter collectively enough to handle these big things. Oh, <clears throat> Oh, maybe, oh, and then suddenly the idea of a computer and the electronics that I'd learned with radar and sonar of screens, how electronics can make things draw on the screen, and in fact how the electronics on a radar can respond to the user, the operator. Oh, well, if a computer, all I knew about it is they can punch cards or print on paper, well then certainly I just knew instinctively you can make electronics that would put anything you want on a screen. And if they can read punch cards, they can certainly read what a human does. And it just, 
you know, I just knew instinctively that you could make it so you could interact with one. And somehow that just came to a picture of, boy, that's what I could go after. And did you frame it with the idea of augmentation at that point? Did, did no, it took, it took okay. years to... Uh, so the idea was there, but to actually get the structure... Well, it was going to augment. It was going to be able to do things. And like, oh, in the same computer complex, you could tie a number of these uh, workstations together, and you could collaborate. And, uh, oh, boy, let's just go. And then, then I realized that it would be handy to have some research <laughs> you know, talents or training, and, well, I should go to the graduate school yeah. and... Uh, that Berkeley had a research project that they were building an experimental computer. Uh, but it was, it was, you already had the idea of the system you want to build, and so you needed skills, and that you knew that they were working on a computer project, and that was, became the place to go. To yeah, that plus how do you do research? You know, the whole thing about equipping yourself to be able to be qualified to do the kind of research. Um, you tell me about meeting Ballard. Um, you're, oh, you're, she was a girl. That <laughs> but you, I remember uh, you told me at one point that when you were at Ames, a lot of times you would just go over and hang out at the library at Stanford. You weren't a real social guy. Um, probably the stacks at Stanford libraries were not the best place to meet young women. Yeah, well, I, I was kind of thinking I'd like to meet women. I'd... I'd I'd had an interest in uh, soaring, soaring planes. So I started going with a group and meeting with them that were learning how to do that. And then one day I suddenly realized there's nothing but men in here. <laughs> so then I, I asked the guys at, at work, well, where do you go to meet girls? And, well, see, they were, most of them were married. They didn't have all that many ideas, except one of them mentioned that, well, he hears that in the Palo Alto city center, they have uh, folk dancing classes. Oh, and I just pictured something that turned off. So, but anyway, I went over there one evening and stood there and watched an intermediate class, and it just intrigued Helen. I I was very clumsy and bashful, and I I couldn't do ballroom dancing effectively. It was just a real sweat. But I watched what all these people were doing. Oh boy! And so even though they were an intermediate class. At the next break, I scooted out there and grabbed a woman who was starting to, well, I'd, I'd never done any of that, but I, so I began to be a regular at that, and, and uh, that's where I met Ballard. And, that's and, a great story. So you, you moved to Berkeley. Um, you got a PhD in electrical engineering? Yeah. Okay. But it was basically um, the design and, and research leading to com computer well, systems. Because, you could take the computer option of doing research and talking about that. And, um, and I happen to remember some strange bistable phenomena in gaseous discharges, like neon tube or something, that you could install. You put a radio wave, a radio wave across it like this, and, uh, and that's the way we would tune the transmitters. You know, the brighter that light, you hold that up near the antenna, and the, as you adjust the power level, the brighter it got, the more power out there. Then I noticed one day that also as you backed it down, it would stay lit at a lower voltage level than it took to get it going. Oh, you know, at that intermediate stage, if it were lit, it would stay lit. If it weren't, it wouldn't get lit. And so. I thought, well, that'd be an interesting thing in the computer world of another bistable sort of phenomena. And so I built shift registers of little, little patterns of glow, no glow would just shift around. But it's far too clumsy and slow for, for like really. modern. Um, and yet it led you to your, didn't it lead you to your first sort of business venture? Yeah. So you, you, you were an entrepreneur. That was sort of a sidetrack, but yet you, oh, you wanted to do something with the technology? Was that? Well, it turned out there was some fast-talking patent attorney that happened to bump in when I was at school there like that and said, hey, you could get these things patented. So 
there were 13 or 14 patents came out of this. Uh, you know, they, you could almost build a whole computer out of these little gaseous plasma things. Um, but it, it just, you know, then there was the chance, he said, you know, you could actually start a business and have this go. And one thing you could do is make a very interesting kind of signs for people because they could have these neon tubes around like that and the little glow note patterns would move around them so you could have just very interesting things. So, okay, but I, was, I, I wasn't destined to be a businessman or something, so <laughs> the backers we had pulled out after about four or five months. And yeah. There were some San Francisco store owners, weren't they, who, who ultimately invested in the project, wasn't it? One of the retail stores in San Francisco, the, the family? Yeah. I think they, I can't so, remember but it, it 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 went nowhere. When it didn't work out, what did you decide to do next? Oh, then I then I decided I'd really like to get into doing some real research and get going after the computer things I wanted. And so uh, um, I had I had been doing this while I was still teaching. I was an acting assistant professor at Berkeley after I got my degree for two years and. Um, so something that happened in that environment, too, was very telling. Because <laughs> um, Ballard and I continued folk dancing and, and we're getting acquainted with university people. And one time there was a party one Saturday that a, one of the guys, friends of ours, he was a, an, an associate professor in economics or something, but he, just very nice people. So after the party, I was helping him clean up. And he happened to say, well, what's your special interest, Doug? And, you know, because if you're in that university position, this is what you have to be doing. And I started telling him, and he slowed down his work and finally looked at me and says, well, um, you are aware, aren't you, of how promotion is handled in universities? Naive country kid shines through again and says, well, um, no, not really. <laughs> Uh, so he explains to me about peer review and that you get promoted by writing papers that get submitted and accepted in the best journals. And the peer review decides, you know, your peers review it and that decides what gets in. He said, so I can tell you right now, if you keep talking like you are now, you'll be an acting assistant professor forever. <laughs> and uh, I, I just really, suddenly I got it. But the funny thing is, then I thought we thought of coming down the university, uh, peninsula to get some jobs. Well, there was no Silicon Valley, but there was a Hewlett Packard. And uh, we had used their test equipment in the, in the Navy, so I knew about their story. So I went there and, oh, this interesting things I had done for my thesis work intrigued them and such. So, boy, they offered me a job in the research. And, uh, now you you met with both Hewlett and Packard. It was a small enough group that it was it was David Packard who offered you the job, wasn't it? No, the the head of research oh, that's right. was uh, br um, Barney Oliver. Barney Oliver. But at some point you had a discussions with, with Packard. Both, both, yeah. Yeah. And I remember Packard said, "Didn't Packard tell you you could oh, keep the technology that you this? Uh, what I just happened. He was such a straightforward guy. I just happened to say, well, I've got this problem. There are quite a few different." idea inventions I've had from my thesis work that I haven't patented yet and but I know when I go to work for you I've got to sign over all the patents so what do I do about that? He came up just instantly with this thing, uh, well I'll tell you, how about this? For the first six months everything you can write disclosures on will be yours no matter whether you thought of them our place or before. After six months they'll be ours whether you thought about them before or after and that just impressed me so much of just the honest, straightforward kind of way to do it. I just never forgot that. Yeah. And, uh, so they offered you a job, yeah. uh, and you didn't take it. Yeah. Tell me, tell me well, wh what happened. Well, I was driving home then all excited, and by the time I got up here by Redwood City or something, I thought, oh, wait a minute. And I stopped and called Barney Oliver up, and I said, oh, um, I forgot to check on something that I'm totally committed to working with computers, and so I'm assuming you guys will get to be working with them soon. So I just wanted to check on that, as though it's just maybe a check. And he said, 
oh, sorry, Doug, not a chance. And uh, so that, I said, okay, I guess that closes off our deal. Yeah. And, um, what was the next step? So you, you were still well, looking. Just for the hell of it, I tried Stanford and wrote him a letter telling how I could, I knew how to uh, conduct laboratories and classes in basic digital technique of learning and such. And uh, the Dean of Engineering, who was a very good guy and such, wrote back a letter saying, well, thank you for your interest in Stanford. But I must say, we're a very small university, and we have to specialize in highly academic topics, et cetera, for our research world. And uh, since computers are only a service activity, we don't contemplate ever having computer classes, design classes, or whatever. And uh, Do you remember if that was Terman or Linville? Do either of those names ring a bell? Oh, sure. Uh, they both ring a bell, but that wasn't. Either of them. Uh, so, so Stanford wasn't going to be a computer um, either, research organization either. anytime soon. Either, yeah, like like Berkeley. So, where did you turn so next? Then I went to Stanford Research Institute, which later changed its name to SRI International, and they they had the job at that time of actually developing a computer for the Bank of America's use, and um, but it was so that sounded promising. But again, this time. Uh, I happened to, the first one I talked to at SRI was somebody who'd left Berkeley before I had by a couple of years, and he'd never found out what my driving interest was. And uh, so he, he asked me, well, I guess I've never found out. And I started telling him, and he went, he started looking shocked, and he says, have you talked to anybody else? No, you're the first one. Well, I'd advise you, don't. Just tell them about your patents and your research and don't talk about that computer stuff because uh, that'll turn turn people off. Yeah. And then you can get hired. You could be here and have a chance sometime to uh, get the support. Yeah. So they did offer you a job, and it was with which group? It wasn't with a group. It was just plunking in a laboratory <clears throat> and sort of like then you scout around to see uh, who would be interesting, you know, who would be interested and interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I they, they, they weren't interested in, the, in the, the, building the computer for the Bank of America didn't really appeal to me, but uh, then I met Hugh Crane and his magnetic logic things. So this was a group funded by the Pentagon. They were hopeful about uh, the development of magnetic logic technology for what, <coughs> whatever reason, <coughs> military reasons. I'm not or... sure who funded them, because this was considerably before uh, that. What's now the Information Processing Techniques Office okay. got established in ARPA, okay. and uh, but these could be the building blocks. These could have been the building blocks for computers of the future. That was one of the ideas, possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they. It'd be quite slow, yeah. and um, so I helped with that. And um, you developed some some innovative magnetic um, yeah. devices, right? At, at this group, um, switches or well, the first thing they're having were just shift registers. You could shift bits down a long chain, you know, a whole pattern, and um, and they were multi aperture devices. Uh, a large toroid with small holes, you know, a bump around it, a small hole in the case goes around. Yeah. And it turned out that you could put current through there, it would lock lock out the magnetism that would go around and, and uh, that if you pulsed that hard when the rest of it collapsed, that would make enough of a signal to transmit it to the next one, a thing of this sort. And, uh, it was while you were working with this group that you went to Philadelphia to a, a meeting of um, the International Circuits Conference. You traveled with Hugh Crane. This must have been 1960, perhaps, to give a paper about the idea of, um, I think it was called similitude. And it was about scaling. It was, you were putting some ideas together, ideas that you'd had. Well, when, when I was going around during the I came to SRI in 1957, and um, 
So I was kind of hoping there'd be a chance to get into something with more active computer thing. But one day I happened to be talking to a, a program manager, research manager uh, in the Air Force, and uh, I just happened to tell him about the interest I'd gotten about this similitude, this scaling issue about airplanes, and that uh, <clears throat> uh, it'd be very interesting to study that for electronic components too, because you know, if you make things smaller and smaller, they just naturally get faster. <clears throat> So oh, I got a grant to do that. So uh, then I, I did enough in that to kind of find much better ways to explain it and um, why a device that this size would probably stop working if you make it one-tenth the size. And um, that's generally because some of the phenomena that you're harnessing in there are affected directly by the linear measure of something. Others are affected by the area, and others by the volume. Of course, all those change. They don't change it the same way as just change the scale. And um, so phenomena that work together at this size would stop being able to latch together this thing, but new phenomena could be found. And um, so I just thought, oh, that's terrific, because the knowing that, that uh, the this, this speed increases as well as the density of the things like that. So, boy, I just said that that's an extremely important for the computer world because if we're talking about things I'm hoping for, it's got to be able to get faster and more, more powerful computers. So you proved to yourself that there was going to be enough computing power to build the kind of machine that you wanted to it build. It just seemed inevitable. Yeah. I know. So you'd stumbled across the thing that would become known in 1965 or much later, but you, you stumbled across Moore's Law or the the, the scaling process. Well, the, yeah, not the law about yeah, how much it's going to change, yeah. but the, yeah. the underlying phenomenon that would be codified by the industry. Um, so who at SRI sort of uh, did you, you bump into who let you begin to work on building a machine to augment human intelligence? Who, wh wh was it outside or was it inside SRI that you got the ori original support? Oh, outside. Okay. <laughs> but. Charlie Rosen was sympathetic to your ideas, wasn't he? I mean, he, he was helpful, I, th I think. I remember oh, yeah. that. Yeah. In terms of funding or? Well, just, just encouragement. Yeah. He couldn't give me any funds or something. Yeah. It was, was it the Air Force first who was the, your first funder? Yeah. Um, it was called the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, just a sort of a one man, a four person office. Uh, and uh, it just, it just happened that uh, he was a wild-eyed enough character that he thought, well, I, I just said, I, I want to write a study about what's the chances of and what's the payoff potential for interactive use of computers. And um, so he, he gave me some money to do this study, enough so I could just start sitting down and, and working. and. Uh, no computer, though. You were you were working entirely with ideas. Oh, there was weren't weren't computers available. Yeah. That's <clears throat> any time. Anyway, so th I was just stubborn enough that that's what I'm going to do. And even even when the that kind of money didn't quite reach what it would take to support me full time, the institute had what they call the internal R and D, where they would use overhead money to sponsor something that would hope to develop into a prog funded program. And um, so I kept plugging away. And uh, you wrote some papers. Yeah. And, that f and um, I wrote the one about scaling before that on that other one. Right. Um, so I ended up with this one sizable report after about a year and a half or more. So in the fall of 1962, there was a quite large report called Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And uh, just uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours of painful trying to get, carrying it through and such. But uh, out of that came 
a, a, real, a real difference from the people whose terminology was oriented about automating our jobs, computer automating. And uh, I said, well, gee, it's more than that. It can change the way you work and think. And so I pulled up this term augmentation and uh, realizing how much else changes besides the artifacts we bring in. And uh, I try to explain to people, well, do you think that uh, elevators just automated everybody's ability to get up to the top floor, seventh or eighth floor, and that was all? You know, look what happened. <clears throat> Buildings phew, went way up. And then air conditioning had to change. And oh, population density or office business density, well, that changes, you know, the commuting in and out had to change. Well, just a huge amount of changes. And uh, the ideas were there. Who gave you the money to actually begin to implement them with a computer? Uh, well, first, a guy who's now an historic figure. Uh, he was a engineering-oriented guy from the MIT area, and uh, MIT and Harvard, and. He'd written a book called Man-Computer Symbiosis, or a, a paper. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was trying, and ARPA brought him down to help set up the first information processing techniques office. So he set that up. And I was right there with proposals. So he This was J.C.R. Licklider. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, that allowed you to acquire a, an early small CDC machine? Was that your first? No, there were. There were a sequence of different machines, but that one had a very small one. Um, but it turned out that, um, you know, you know, even what I talked about paradigm, I haven't yet, but the paradigms that made it hard for me to stay in a university because who, who's going to work with computers interactively and so on like this. So the paradigm thing was just so prevalent and really impeded me immensely for the decades. Did you know it at that time that you needed to break out of paradigms to begin oh, thinking yeah. of new ideas? So that yeah. was part of the, the, the research struggle right from the start. Yeah, when doing that long study about augmenting human intellect, this, this came out quite clearly. and. Um, and I found a book that would describe the name of it, what paradigms were, et cetera. That can't remember the author, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It was very important. And um, This wasn't the structure of scientific revolutions. That came later, didn't it? That hadn't been written yeah. by yeah. when you were. Um, so anyway, the, the paradigms, it's sort of like this paper about augmenting the human intellect just seems so outlandish or out of this world to the administrators at SRI that uh, when the first money came to me to do that, they uh, politely told me that they'd promote me to be a senior research engineer and sit off and write more things like this. And they'd put John in charge of the project because he was a computer programmer and knew how to do things like John that. John was one of the first people who worked for you, or who was? No. it. it I, I was moved aside, and if I ever tried to talk to them, I would get scolded. Leave them alone. John knows what he's doing, and it was just, it was just a, a parody on. So how did you get out of that? Well, that went, <laughs> and Licklider came to, to visit. I was I was so naive I didn't think of complaining to him or something about what happened, uh, and I. You know, for years, I still am too naive about the politics of all sorts of organizational environments. And uh, did Licklider introduce Taylor to you, or did Taylor find his way to you? In I found Taylor. He was working for NASA. That's right. And then told him about ARPA and Licklider, and uh, so then he went over there later. But I see. Uh, anyway, when Lick found out. You know, he sort of closed down that 
that project, and it wasn't until another time it was too small a computer, and we had to, it was be like the client that would work with a time-sharing computer, which was under development down in Southern California. <laughs> but this was, you would, that was where you started the online system. Uh, you were doing the original development down in, the programming was being done down in Southern California because that's where the computer was. Well, we could program and, uh, remotely oh, and remotely. like that, but, yeah. but that thing, this, that computer was never working, it was always crashing, <laughs> yeah. so that one didn't work. And uh, then we got, uh, then we got a, another one that was big enough to start doing it, and that's the one where we put the display on it and uh, I got the money to do a research project on trying to test the different kind of display selection devices. And that's when I came up with the idea of the mouse, which got added into the other devices we were testing. Okay, and this so, was 63, 64? Yeah, late 62 and 63. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, what drove you to the mouse was how to interact with the display. Yeah, it was just, while well, we were getting these different devices, and then I happen to remember sketching up some ideas like that, that was the first mouse, and, and uh, Bill English was setting up the engineering for this, and we had to make our own computer display. You couldn't buy them, <laughs> and uh, I think it cost us $90,000 in 1963 money. Did the technology come from the radar world? Where did you get the components to build it? Well, people had been talking about doing that, so we just had to build it from scratch. Yeah. Uh, and the way it, the way it was is uh, it would move the move the curse move move the beam and write the characters. I see. That there wasn't nearly enough storage capacity to have pixel. So you, you built and you had at that point were you developing your own character generators as well. Yeah. That was the architecture? The writing of that. So that took a, a hunk of electronics. It was about a you know, a table this size and about six feet by four feet or three feet by four feet full of electronics that was a display driver. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then the computer display it looked pretty good. And I've seen the pictures. It wasn't square. Uh, your first display, I believe, was a, wasn't it a round screen? Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, because you know. there weren't square screens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you told me once. But that anyway, that's what we then had available to use. Hang on a second, guys. One second. Oh, Doug, you were playing with the microphone, I guess. Oh. The oh, it's, it's it. just be careful of the top. No, just be just be careful. It, it was thumping into the audio, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we start again? Yeah. You, you um, start is this too much detail? No, this is great. Oh. This, this is. I want to get all the detail I can, so don't worry. About it. I'll. I'll. Um, mm. You told me once about the the sort of the thought process that led you directly to the mouse. You were at a meeting, and I think you said you were a little oh. bored, and so you were just sort of oh, that's, daydreaming. That's a second stage. The first stage was years before when I was a senior in college, and. Uh, uh, I took the power option instead of the electronic option because I'd had a lot of electronics in the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were doing these tests on big heavy generators and everything like this. And uh, then you have to plot the data. And then there's some point in there in which the data plot makes a closed loop. And you have to figure out what the area under is. So there's a device that you get that the planks down solid. And it's an elbow-like thing with a pointer at the end. And uh, a little round, sharp edge wheel at that, another one at the elbow. And when you go around this thing, the change in how much those wheels turn, uh, you can use those to calculate what the area of, no matter what the shape was. Right. And I asked the, the instructor, well, how does that work? He said, well, all I know is that those wheels like that, if it axes like that, they'll only roll along this direction, no matter what if you do like this, they'll only roll as far as you went in that direction. And uh, so it was during some kind of a conference in which I was <laughs> bored that I thought of that and brought my little notebook and said, oh, you know, if you put two of them together like this, one would be telling you how far this way and the other this way. And 
That's all. To capture the movement of the XY axis. Yeah. So you just compress that into a box, basically, yeah. and that's the computer mouse. Right. That's great. So, so Bill, I told him, sketch that for him, and he built the first one. You went to the machine shop, and they built a, a wooden box. Oh, no, this was... Even before? It got, well, it, uh, you design it so somebody has to do a mechanical design drawings to tell the machine shop what to do. So there's a mechanical draftsman kid that was doing that, and uh, he happened to say, oh, I'm a... Uh, I'm a, my hobby is wood, wood carving. I can make a case over it. So that's how that got there. And uh, all we were doing is testing the select so one button read, and we didn't think about it, but the cord came out this tail end. So sitting there, and somebody, and we still don't know who, among the five or six people involved in designing and building and setting up the experiments, et cetera, and tests and training the subjects and so on, Somebody in there started calling it a mouse, because I don't think about giving names to things like that. And uh, but uh, so this is so no one no one knows. So yeah. it's lost in history. Yeah, it's lost in history. And um, the first one had one button, the right. very first one you built. But what what was the right number of buttons? Did did you think about how many buttons you wanted after you built yeah. the first one? Oh yeah, right. And what? What was your thought process? Well, all we could get on. I could only get three in there the way it was designed, so that's... <laughs> that but really, more would have been better if you could have... Yeah, I would have. Because yeah. uh, I don't know how, how Steve Jobs says one button or something like that, but you've got lots of action here like yeah. that you can do. And uh, that uh, it just seems silly to me not to use that. So if you could be more powerful, if you could have more power in the hand, that would be... That would be ideal. Well, this is this sort of in, gets into that paradigm situation again of uh, you know what's easy to learn, <laughs> see, versus what are you capable of doing, and you can learn, and when you learn, it'll be easy. And if, if you just realize how many things you do that that when you're born aren't conditioned into that, you know, just all kinds of skills that uh, take for granted. Yeah. And, uh, well, typing, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so, so I was just saying, sure, this opens up the interface as something in which we're exploring capability and uh, let's go after capability. And this, I was just sure that every knowledge worker in the future was going to be working this way. Yeah. And, uh, well, we can talk about that. Well, but you talk, uh, there, there are a whole bunch of little pieces here, big pieces. Um, another device you d developed was a cord key keyboard. Um, it turned out not to be a success in terms of acceptance in the bigger market, but it was a way that you were experimenting with breaking down paradigms. Well, it's just a way to improve capability. Because yeah. if you're using the mouse, you can't type. Yeah. And... Uh, so that leads to the thing of all the point and click, uh, uh, uh. And it, to me, that was like pidgin English, <laughs> you know. Uh, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so the actually command language we developed was just saying, I want it, you got a, got a bunch of verbs. You want actions you want to do on a bunch of different kind of objects with the, designated by nouns. Right. So we, we had that, and this was the absolute minimum number of keystrokes to set up any command. Like just DW would flash up delete word. So you hit DW, click, click, the word's gone. CW, I want to copy the word. Click, click, gets copied. See? Replace the word. Or oh, a paragraph, a sentence, just all kinds of things. Visible string just meant, you know, it would be a word plus any punctuation or something. So we ended up with many verbs and many nouns that uh, if somebody came and looked at that, oh, but it's just like you learn an, an extension to your natural language if you come into some new kind of environment. Uh, By this time, you'd begun to build the online system. One second, we need to change the sure. tapes. Yep. The camera turn. Gotcha. Good, good spot for a yeah. hold. <laughs>
But the par paradigm issue is pretty huge. I, I, um, somebody, let's see. About the time where, where you did your mouse thing at the Ox Park, and, uh, I was at the History Museum for some reception they had, and I met a guy who worked at us at National Science Foundation. And I didn't know him, but I just got talking and found out he did. And uh, so I said, well, I wonder, you know, I'm not in a university and I'm pretty old. We got to talking and stuff. So uh, he called me up later and invited me to come at the end of the month to talk to the staff at NSF. And did you do that recently? That's the end of this month. Oh, you just you just went? No. Oh, you're just going? No, at, you know, at the end of August. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Oh, that's yeah, good. So it's just like, yeah. hey, it's excellent. Time. And so, a big thing I want to get to them is a lot of examples of the paradigm issue. Yeah. So, um, where did the idea of bootstrapping come from? As part of the augment system, the idea of being <clears> able to to sort of build a system and then build on top of the system and then continue that process. How, where did that idea come from? It, it came out of the two things of that, the model of how we are augment ourselves. We already are augmented and it's a huge amount of things more than just the artifacts we employ. All the skills and the methods and the language and the customs and the organizational structures and all, all kinds of things are there like this that they, all the artifacts are just integrated in. And there's no way you're going to make some huge change in the capability of an organization by just plugging in some new line of arc artifacts. Okay. And so that, that just got to the point of saying, oh, the only way you're going to do it is by helping facilitate the evolution of that whole thing. And was that approach sort of uh, in process in the first half of the 60s? Had you sort of, it, it was clear in your mind that that's the way you would evolve the system. Right, and then, then in the early 70s, what I need, you need to get real people, not just the research kind of guy, real people involved. So we set up an arrangement that DARPA let us, ARPA let us go ahead and uh, start selling NLS usage as service okay. over the ARPANET. Right. And, uh, this was going out great, and we actually had the way to, to cultivate their usage and start helping facilitate their evolution, and what do they need as way well as changes in the tools, et cetera. And but before you did that, you built this system, you had a display, a computing device, a storage device, a sophisticated software system that allowed you to do uh, text editing and hypertext. You had all of the ingredients of modern personal computing. Um, you showed it to the world for the first time, really, in 1969. 68. Was it December of 68? Yeah. It was. It was at Brooks Hall in San Francisco. It probably is the most famous computer demonstration in history. How did it happen? What led to the demonstration? Well, it's, um, it's our NLS system was getting more and more interesting and useful, and uh, it just occurred to me that still it was very hard to tell any of the colleagues out in the world that were computer-oriented people what we were doing and why. And so it would be great instead of just giving a paper at a conference is to demo it. And we had the kind of te technology on hand that could do that uh, because I, f I found out that the telephone company was actually in the business that they would lease, set up and lease for you video line links. So we had two, two links, one-way links, going from, San, from SRI up to the city. And um, then we had to build a modem. To carry the data. To, so that we could run it from the city. And yeah. you couldn't buy a modem, so Bill English Jeffers and put together a modem. And uh, uh, then Bill English had happened to uh, been very active, he and his wife, in amateur theater. And so he knew how you had to direct and run things. And uh, so he, he not only arranged for the communication up there and all of this, but 
Then he built a, uh, a platform about this high uh, that was covered with canvas where he sat there with the two feeds from coming up like this, but also then the feed that would go up to the projector. And that the projector pro was this remarkable device. I mean, it was, the screen was huge by, by, the only way they could make screens in those days of that size was with film. But you were doing video projection. Well, we just happened to stumble some months before that, because we never could have done it without that. And something, I think it was called Ida 4. Ida 4 projector. Right. And it, the phenomena by which it made, it modified the light, it sort of had a mirror that was coated, a mirror surface was thin film of mercury. And it was in a vacuum. And the electron beam could go there like this. And it turns out that the charge density on the surface of the mercury would deform it a little bit like this. And that was all it took to bend the light as it come down. And it would then go through a grating so that which was bent would be darker at that point, something like this. But it was just a magic thing. It was wild. something about six foot high and three by two feet or something like this on wheels. That With an there. arc light as its light source, right? A really bright light source. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so you sat up on stage. Right. You had the keyboard, the chord key set. And the mouse key set. And uh, it was all on a kind of a molded uh, thing fit on the chair with swivel. That it turned out that Herman Miller Furniture Company, uh, that the designer there had gotten really interested in what we did, so they built those chairs for us. <laughs> you, know, you know, I talked to them about it about two months ago. They're still very proud of the fact that they helped you. Oh, really? Yes, and they have pictures. I should send you the picture. I have a picture of you consulting with a Herman Miller person about the design of that they still have in their archives. Oh, that's true. I'll send it to you. But anyway. Oh yeah, that was that was really something. So uh, anyway, then then. Bill English also had an audio line going back down to the peninsula, and then uh, he'd be telling people. He's, I wrote the script, script for it all, and then and it included people from the lab tying in and doing things. And Bill was. Then we had volunteer people with. We borrowed the video cameras that made. The, <laughs> generated the displays for our people and we had a very great fix up but uh, the uh, so it was just so much leveraged temporary put together things that it could have crumbled during the time you had an audience of about a thousand I some, don't know literally how many some of the best computer scientists in the country People before that didn't think of computing as interactive, and you showed them. Well, if they did, they, they had a very different idea from what I had done. And, uh, this is really the first public demonstration of the kind of interactive computing that we all take for granted now. Yeah, and, and more that we're doing things there that just totally got cut away awesome. because they didn't fit paradigms. Yeah. You know, well, we had hyperlinks going, but hyperlinks all kinds of between everything and everything. You could link to anything. Yeah. And the hyperlinks that we, and also all kinds of optional viewing. So one thing is I'd view and I'd clip paragraphs so I only showed the first three lines, for instance. And so in the next line would be the big, long, ugly link kind of thing. You wouldn't see that, so, but if you said jump to link, the system would go looking downstream for the link and take it. So that's how we changed almost every scene was just jumping on links around inside that and with different views and we had graphics working at the time you know can make that map for instance of you know how I'm going to get home this evening <laughs> doing all the shopping for my wife and uh, so what do you remember about the, uh, the audience reaction when you finished your demonstration well uh, during the demo the lights in my eyes were so bright I couldn't see the audience. See, I just had to know they're there. And so when all got done, and I went, boy. So I was unstrapping myself and getting up, and the lights went out, and I saw everybody was standing up, applauding wildly. And I thought, oh, whew. you know, just feeling so lucky that we got through without crashing. <laughs> and uh, but 
but it was a strange thing. There was a lot of excitement, and the next day, you know, we had the stuff on another room, and people could come and see, and we could show them yeah. the live demos. But um, it's just like oh, all excitement after that. The, not, it's just like nothing happened in the world. Well, let's 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 talk about that a little bit because in a, in a way, let's talk about the future and sort of what got lost and what still needs to be done. Um, so there were some ideas that got taken away and they turned into commercial products, whole industries. But I think I've come to understand that your feeling is that s something didn't get taken away. Oh boy! And tell me about what still needs to be done. Well. I think the focus needs to be on capabilities that you can drive and take the business of uh, cost of learning and set it aside until you assess the values of the higher capabilities you can go after. Whereas it has seemed like there was some level like this, I don't know how it got set, but early 70s just got to be easy to learn. And uh, with all due respect to all the human computer interface guys, that just to me has just been a you know, I point out to people, hey, we'd all be still be riding tricycles. Yeah. You have that's... this great of a big adult guy on a tricycle, or yeah. your other interesting way of getting this idea is about taking a pencil and attaching a brick to it, yeah. and how ineffective it is with the brick on the end of it. Right. So your argument is this original idea you had about machines that augment human intelligence, we got trapped on the curve somewhere and it flattened out. It was somehow the automation idea got in there. And then the, during the early years, it was office automation. The real user is a secretary. Therefore, you have to make it easy for her to learn, etc. And I kept trying to say, no, the real user is tomorrow's knowledge worker. Ah, ha, ha, ha. You're a nice guy, Doug, but. Um, so how do we get back on the curve? So I understand your principle. Um, you know, somehow we got off the curve. You think we could continue to build more powerful tools that oh, would get us back on this? Absolutely. And there's a, a big part of that is uh, the paradigms about, hey, uh, one, one thing is the, quote, book, unquote, book paradigm, that that just built into everybody's sort of parad paradigmatical <laughs> outlook is that's the way you read and study. And you say, well, no, wait, that's just the way an artifact that they call printing and such produced things that would help you do that. Yeah. We've got a brand new set of artifacts now, so let's change our paradigms. Let's say what we can do. And so that's what I started doing in the 60s. I say, for one thing, you don't want to be able to jump around. So not just a link pointing to another document, but I want to, I want to jump. Oh, I want to jump. There were just a huge number of jumps. You could just say what you wanted done. I want to jump to the next chapter. I want to jump back to the rich origin. Oh, then you start saying the different views. You know, one line only, one, this, and the optional views just kept growing and growing. And the, the kind of moving around you could do kept getting more flexible because your jumping and viewing was. Well, then also, since you can address anything so flexibly for a jump, you can also address very flexibly for any editing you want to do. I want to move this chapter to follow this chapter in this other book. Mm -hmm. That's just one command. Move branch. So the tools are, the tools are just, they got stunted somewhere along the way. The, the original yeah. model was to have tools that people might, they might be hard to learn, but once you learn them, you would be so much more powerful. That's right. Yeah. To look at capability, see? And so, Nobody ever did. Yeah. They just uh, uh, poo pooed. It's sort of like in that '68 thing. It, it, a funny thing happened that early this summer, there was a, a European conference, computer-based conference. They called Reboot, right. and it was time to sort of restudy some of the older things that had done. And so, for one thing, they got the 90-minute video that we happened to be lucky enough to record uh, that '68 demo. And they showed the whole 90 minutes to everybody there. And all of the, the results that they had were just, uh, you know, just raving remarks of why, you know, we're still not able to do a lot of those things. People are still surprised. Well, one of the things I, I, I didn't want to end without 
noting and asking you what your memories are. You know, today's internet started with the ARPANET, and the ARPANET started with two nodes. And one of them was at, uh, in Southern California, and the other one was at Menlo Park in the, in the Augment project. So I think that's important, but what I think nobody knows is that you know, the, the modern internet is built on these things called re requests for proposals, and the holes, the standards effort. And if you go back and you read RFP number one, um, the original ARPANET was built to make the use of NLS, the online system that you designed, uh, remote use of it possible. So your NLS system was, I, I think, the first killer app was supposed to be the first killer app for the ARPANET, which became the internet. And do you, do you remember that discussion? What led to them wanting to, to use NLS in that way? Or to, was it the idea well, to I make think, it more? I don't think it was quite that direct. It was uh, at, the, at the event, it was a meeting of all the principal investigators ARPA had in the computer domain. I think it was the University of Michigan, I think. And uh, that when Bob Taylor and Larry Roberts, the two guys running that office, told us all that they were going to go ahead and put together this network on a brand new mode of doing a network. And uh, boy, I just right away thinking about the excitement about the collaboration you could do like this. But all they were talking about is sharing resources. If I have special data, you can get access to it. If you have special computer processes, I can send stuff there to get it done, actually. And uh, for me, I looked, hey, this is great. But there was a, an interaction that went on then. The two guys sitting next to me, you know, big shots and little small eagles, of course. But, um, you know, so one of them turned to the other and says, well, what do you have in your computer that I could use? You know, if this, you know, the other guy, you know, just as quick-witted, so, well, don't you read my reports? And this guy gets them, and he gets back with a killer, well, do you send them to me? Knowing that guy has no idea where his reports go. And they both realize that's never going to get in any place, so they turn together to talk to Taylor and Roberts to say, well, how are we going to know what's on everybody else's computer? And it just appeared right then that that hadn't really been thought through. Well, I've been sitting there thinking, hey, that provides a tremendous way for communication and the whole thing. And so I volunteered to start a network information center there on Servit, and that's, that's sort of why they put me, my computer on early. And so that, that worked and ran for quite a few years. And as it turned out, a couple dec decades later, it changed the world. This has been good. Thank you for the stories. Yeah. Oh, but the <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we, we could go on for the rest of the day. Yeah, right. it's a, there, there are a lot of them. But thanks. Yeah, it's good.